Welcome back, everyone. Uh, recently, I've been uh, working on something a little bit depressing. Well, is it depressing? Is it interesting? Obviously, a lot of my time gets allocated to things that aren't necessarily Blender or Blender product related. I spent all of January and most of February studying a medical problem, largely spending time in a giant spreadsheets and trying to predict how the problem will change over time. And I didn't really want to use Blender to do any kind of like data visualization for this issue. But it got to a point in the spreadsheets where I just got annoyed that I couldn't like overlap graphs with other information or predictions or just like notes in general. So I got to a point where I was like, oh, just, just put some of it in Blender and let's see what happens. What we're looking at here is a chart of symptom severity where every sphere or circle, but it's a sphere in the actual 3D space, represents the average severity of the problem throughout the days. This is actually breathlessness that I'm recording here. And what we see is we see like waves going up and down. So see a wave up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up and down. I won't get into the details of what the ups and the downs represent. I've actually spoken a little bit about it on the second channel. It's a little bit controversial because it kind of breaches into some uh, COVID related territory and I don't want to put anything out there that can be used as fuel for like conspiracy theorists and stuff. Um, for me, it's nothing controversial, but I just need to be careful with what I say and how I explain it to people. It's to do with histamine intolerance. Not something that I was born with, but something I picked up over time. And histamine intolerance is a largely under-researched area of like post-COVID symptoms, and as it seems, vaccine reactions. So that's why we can't really talk about it at the moment. But one thing I wanted to do in Blender was try and see if I could visualize new ways of trying to find patterns and links. So first of all, if I look at my collections here, so we've got like food, medication, supplements, activity, and exposure. What I can do is if I take a look at things like supplements and I go to magnesium, we can see the exact days when I've taken magnesium but it stops here because I haven't put all of my data into Blender yet. It does actually continue onwards and magnesium is a daily thing for me, except for some odd days. But I thought it'd be handy to do lines that kind of look like they're pointing up and then kind of tugging down on the spheres. Because in some cases, especially for things like food, which is more important, we can see in this one, for example, is the influence of Pepsi Max, right? So a caffeinated drink. So you can look at these things in isolation and go, okay, well, did wherever uh, Pepsi Max is drank have a positive or a negative influence the next day and it's not always consistent right so you can sit here and you can look at it and go well it goes up on that day and it goes um up here but then down so that's unreliable in this one it doesn't really make much of a change but it does go up at a later time here it kind of stays consistent here it goes down afterwards here down but then here up so over time you can kind of look and you go ah it's not too suspicious, maybe sometimes, but not every time. Now, I do actually have a way of calculating whether a food is suspicious, right? And it's on my spreadsheet system. I call it the um, speculation system, and it's very reliable, right? It highlighted that high histamine foods are suspicious for me. That's things like red meat, spinach, bananas, types of sauces, and things like that. So I, I already have an answer for that. So the thing which I really wanted to find with the help of Blender was like whether I could highlight risk factors that overlap. Now I have an idea for this. I don't know if it'll work. So for example, if I knew that my green vegetable mix being activated there, which includes spinach, and if I knew that bananas contributed and that steak for example, so I'll turn that on. Then the cheese, so like when I have a ham and cheese sandwich, if that contributes. So if I turned on a bunch of factors which are having like overlapping red bars, by the way, so some things happen on multiple times per day, so there are bars overlapping. Is there a way to visualize how overlapping things are? So basically, this is just be a matter of transparency, really. They will have the same material applied, but as we can see, even though there's overlaps, they will look the same. So alpha alone isn't really good enough for that. Transmission, maybe. You see, it's the darker ones here, which uh, seem to represent the most overlap, but it's not great to visualize. I'm using cycles instead of Eevee, by the way, which may seem overkill for a graph, but even though I'm using like a sunlight, I was just having some problems with Eevee. So I'm on Eevee now, thankfully it's actually working this time. And the alpha somewhat works for Eevee, but then you see like get this weird clipping. But I am going to stick with cycles because one idea I wanted to try was about light emission. So obviously I do a lot of work with emissive light. It's one of my favorite things to play with. Now I don't know if this will work, but I did a course on exoplanets recently to try and see if I could include education in my day-to-day -day workflow. And I passed the course way, but one of the methods they use to detect exoplanets is transmission spectrography. So obviously for a quick explainer, and even though I did the course, I'll probably butcher it. There are a couple of ways you can find exoplanets around stars. One of them is radial velocity, which is where stars wobble as planets orbit them. Because planets don't orbit perfectly around like the center of the star, because gravity is acting on both objects, right? So you've got the star, which tends to be the more massive object, but you know the universe surprises us in weird ways. And then you have 
an orbiting object. There could be multiple orbiting objects, it doesn't matter. But if we take those two, right, and one spinning around the other, you think that the planet is perfectly orbiting the star, but that's not true. The star is also orbiting the planet, which means that the actual point of orbit for both of them is not in the center of the star, it's offset slightly. For a lot of systems, that offset point will still be in the star, right, the star's influence, but sometimes it can be further out. But what it means is that all stars that have like other gravitational elements around them are wobbling as they orbit, right? So if you look at stars in the sky, you will notice if you take very precise measurements that they're wobbling. And that's an indication that there's something orbiting the star. Now the spectrographic element of that is that if you capture the specter of the star, so if you basically look at the light and you analyze it kind of prismatically, you draw out the wavelengths, you can see what areas of the light spectrum are missing. And that gives you an indication of the chemical composition of the star because certain chemicals will absorb light, which means that they won't be emitted by the star. Now if you take a look at that spectroscopy and you look at the lines of the gaps and you measure that over time for a star, you will see that those lines actually start shifting slightly. So the star is wobbling and the missing parts of the spectrum also wobble. You'll see where I'm going with this in a minute, right? So those lines are going to shift in one of two directions, right? They're going to go along the spectrum towards bluer light or towards redder light. And if you know anything about expanding space, because this is quite a, like a fundamental aspect, things moving further away from you are red shifting and things moving towards you are blue shifting because of how the wavelengths change. They'll compress and they'll expand. That's like the Doppler effect. This is what that indicates is that if you watch a star's shifting spectra, you can kind of tell the shape of the wobble because if it's moving towards the red shift the star's moving away from you and if it's moving towards the blue shift it's moving closer to you so do you see what that means that's the radial velocity but anyway i digress i just did the course i might as well share some of it when i was looking at this graph it distinctively reminded me of spectroscopy because if we imagine the whole day-to-day -day graph as being a light spectrum then we have these bands in between where things either are or are not present. So, get this right, because this is where I feel like there's there's something in this as a data analysis method. If we see where symptoms increase, so areas like this, so that goes up there, that's an up direction, up direction, up direction, up direction. Every time the symptoms get worse, we can predict what the spectrogram should look like for this data, right? So we're trying to apply the theory to prediction. So if we imagine that everywhere something bad happens, we're gonna say that's a black line here. Right, So there's a jump in severity, we'll say there's a black line here, there's a jump there, we'll say there should be a black line here and here. So basically right before an increase, we're going to say that's where a black line should be. This gives us a predictive pattern. So if we're trying to find the cause of a problem, we know the pattern of the cause should look like that roughly, if that makes sense. So what it means is that as we're enabling and disabling potential risk factors, we want to try and find the risk factors that match that pattern. Now, the thing is, there is no one single thing that matches that pattern, because as I've already discovered from my own data analysis, there's no one cause for this problem. It's a multifactorial thing to do with histamine buildup and clearance and DEO and HNMT and mastic granulation episodes, which last for four days and then the body needs to recover. It's a complicated thing, but it is an interesting idea that you could build a predictive absorption like in the data space so you can actually see what risk looks like visually as a spectrum and we're going to take this a bit further because i have an idea of how to represent that in cycles with light right so again we can see more if i just draw out the risk lines so let's turn on the um caffeine one so this is basically pepsi max again which obviously doesn't match up perfectly with the lines so we got one where it does match up and then others where it doesn't and we're going to overlap it again with well, maybe let me turn on something like vitamin D, which is like everywhere, right? Because I'm deficient. So now we want to try and find the areas where the caffeine is overlapping with vitamin D. Let me see if this will work. And if it doesn't, this will be embarrassing because what a waste of a video that was. If I create like a light catching plane behind the graph, right? So we're going to set it just slightly behind the light there. What I want to do is I want to make the red bands emissive and bounce light off the plane to see if we can get like a heat map almost. So if there's an area where the caffeine and the vitamin D are overlapping, then they should produce a stronger impact on the light plane. So let me call that a catcher. And we're going to make it as non-rough as possible. Let's try and make it maybe a bit dark. We do want it to reflect. Um, I probably want to reduce ambient light of all kinds. So where is my sun lamp? So I can disable the sun. Oh, see, I haven't actually tried this yet. So 
probably not going to look great. Obviously, the bars themselves are going to get in the way, but what we need to do is hide them in the camera view. So give me a minute to do this. Obviously, I'll automate it like if this ever becomes a, an actual thing. Okay, so that's vitamin D highlighted. Let's just turn that down. And now let's do caffeine. Okay, so now the caffeine's been disabled and I can see it's already working actually. Let's just remove these annotations. So the thing is, I wasn't checking which ones were overlapping as I was disabling the camera, uh, pathing, right? But just by using emissive light, we can already see the overlapping areas. So we can see patterns or potential causes just by looking at the spectra being reflected in the 3D scene. So path tracing is useful for data visualization. So obviously you could do that, right? By just having like alpha and transmission control in like a rasterization engine. But the problem is there could be a lot of overlapping data in this. In theory, we could also isolate them by color, right? So if I take the caffeine one, I'll call it caffeine uh, red. So we'll say that caffeine produces red light. So I'll link the material like that you see here. And then let's go back to the vitamin D and we'll call that vitamin D blue. So we'll say that vitamin D produces blue light. And now I will link those materials together. Aha, you see what's happening here? Look at me go. Okay, so... What this does is it gives us multi dimensions of, of data, right? So we could say that color is a categorical representation of like cause and effect. You could say that the intensity of the light is another kind of parameter you could play with. So you could categorize the potential causes in different ways and have them represented differently. So the amount of light produced, the color of the light, you could do like the length of the bars as well. But what we can see is that as they overlap, so as we have different categories of things represented on the graph, the overlapping nature of them produces a different visual. So again, if you did, build a predictive light pattern right in this to show where things improved it would give you a complex pattern which you could then compare against other combinations of things to build a fingerprint effectively that you can hunt for and say okay we are looking for this negative influence fingerprint it should have this intensity of light across the entire spectrum it should have this color of light as well and then you can activate so enable and disable different influences like this and then check to see if it matches your predictive chart so it's just like an interesting thing i was thinking about and maybe i want to play with it a bit more kind of combining the things i've learned a bit of emissive light trickery in the blender space a little bit of spectrographic analysis i don't know if it's super useful and i don't know if I mean, maybe this is already a known thing that people do all the time, but I just kind of thought it was interesting. If we like holographically project the data backwards, adjust parameters of it, maybe we can use that as an analysis. Now, obviously that could be like automated over time. So I'm putting all this data in manually, all right, which is obviously quite slow and annoying, but it's something that could obviously be automated. All right, here's another cool thing I'm realizing as well. Obviously, it's useful looking at data when it's objective and show up like this, right? But literally just by changing physical parameters in the 3D space. So if I move the actual light catcher plane backwards on the Z axis, then we blur the spectra. So look here, we can get like a fuzzy analysis because sometimes it's not always the case that like a cause that happened on one day is the actual direct result of the next day. I mean, what I found in my data is that ingesting one thing can sometimes have an influence like 48 hours later. So as well as comparing against like actual predictions, we can look at, again, a band of light like this and then find the most closely representing patterns to what the prediction is. So in this way, it is like so similar to me to the radio velocity and transmission spectrography because even we may not understand, right, how the direct cause and effect lines up from one day to the next. So just like the red and blue shifting, if we took our prediction for what the negative influence should be and then shifted it backwards, we could then compare for that as well. And we could literally render out what we're looking at. If this is like maybe a little bit nerdy and exciting for me, I didn't conceptualize how good like path tracing could be for something like this. So let's just say we do 1920 by 1080. So let's say the camera was in a consistent place every time. We can literally render out the spectrum and then run like automated comparisons on it, like data analysis, like bruh. Why didn't I think of this before? If you like objectively set like a controlled environment in 3D space, right? So same version of the software all the time, same camera position, same bounds, same material values, then you can do comparisons. It's cool. And it doesn't even have to be like straight line shapes either. So let's say that you had graphs like curves going up as well. And then you had like overlapping curves of influence because we're working with emissive light. We could do exactly the same thing. So we could see the intensity. We could see color combinations and changes. We could see, again, based on how far away the catcher is, we can make them fuzzy or more objective. Every time I do a video about emissive light in Blender, people keep saying, oh, isn't this inefficient? Like, aren't you not supposed to use emissive light? There are so many use cases. All right, I'll leave it there before it gets too nerdy. I'm going to see how else. 
I can use this and like actually try and apply it to see if it could be useful. Like obviously the next step, like I said, is, well, first of all, I need to fill in the rest of the data, right? I've got like a whole bunch of stuff I need to transcribe into Blender and copy over from the original spreadsheets. Then I need to build a prediction for what negative influence should look like. Then I should write down a standard for like light intensity for categories of influences and the color. And then I should try and render out what the fingerprint looks like for the negative influence. And then I should then render out different combinations like the foods and the supplements and that to see what they look like in comparison. And then like if we rendered out the spectrum for like every different combination, we could then run comparisons or like a neural net thing to see which combination of factors most closely lines up with the negative prediction. Cool. Okay. You've made it this far, put some kind of, I don't know, data related emoji. What emojis are data related? Or a lab type emoji in the comments. If you put that in the comments, I'll see if you did make it this far through the video. Hope you're having a great day and I'll see you next time. I also just noticed after editing the video that accidentally like leaving on a white bar between like the light being emitted and the catcher means that it will give you like this average color measurement in between anyway. Oh, there's so much potential. Why didn't I see this earlier? There's like there's so much you can do.